Welcome everybody to our to our panel today. I'm gonna. My name is Brett Weissel. I'm the policy and advocacy lead with ECDAM, and we have a terrific panel today. I'm going to pass it off to my wonderful colleague from UNICEF, Arena Diaz, to lead as our our moderator and begin our, our our conversation today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Brett. I was waiting for more participants to join, but yes, let us start. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar on investing in uh, equitable childcare for all. My name is Irina Dia, and I'm the Associate Director for Early Childhood Development at UNICEF. I will be your moderator today for the first panel. We are very excited to have you join us, and we are looking forward to letting our distinguished panel members take the center stage. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a moment to share why this issue is so important to so many of our partners and all of us present here today involved in these webinars, as well as explain how today's event will proceed. Of course, COVID-19 has made childcare even more relevant to many families. National lockdowns, school and childcare closures, and many other disruptions have made important yeah. access to quality childcare more visible to caregivers all over the world. As a result, the issue of childcare has gotten considerable attention. We've seen major reports that present new evidence on the benefits of childcare, quality childcare, while also highlighting the significant challenges and policy gaps that is for most countries and for most parents. We have seen philanthropy make new investments to support governments and civil society. And earlier this year, the World Bank has launched the Child Care Incentive Fund to provide financial and technical support to countries seeking to or already investing in child care. And this increased attention is exactly why we wanted to bring together experts to share the evidence and also provide practical steps for governments as well as advocates to take to strengthen policies and build the necessary political and public commitment. In order to unpack all these complicated issues, we like to pose and answer three important questions. The first one is about governments. Why should they invest in child care and particularly right now? We discuss the short and long-term benefits that results from access to quality child care as well as the urgency of investing in quality child care. The second question is about government still, but what they can do to strengthen national childcare systems. And for that, we'll hear from policymakers in the Asia, Pacific, and Africa regions who have made commitments to childcare and the steps they have taken in order to accomplish that. And finally, we will turn to the civil society to have the perspectives. What are the lessons that have been learned from advocacy campaigns centered around childcare? What strategies have been effective or maybe less effective than you have liked? To. But you also want to be purposeful about showing the intersectorality of these issues and build meaningful bridges between movements focused on gender equality, early childhood developments, labors, and others. And this is important because to achieve the benefits we like to discuss today, Access to childcare must be linked to quality services, and those services must also be linked to livable wages and social protection systems for the childcare workforce. We must link these issues and approach policy development holistically, or we will fail to achieve positive outcomes that we are seeking. With that, I'd like to begin today's discussion, and this is how it's going to work. We will start with opening remarks from Ratne Sahe from the International Monetary Fund and Hannah Brixey from the World Bank. Then we'll move to the first panel that will take a global perspective and focus on the evidence and benefits of quality childcare. After that, we will shift gears to the country and regional levels to discuss the implications and action steps for policymakers and advocates. And that's going to happen during our second panel. Each speaker will have five minutes to share their perspective on this issue. And colleague panelists, if you see me appearing on your screen, it means you are, you are, it's time for you to wrap up. You have a few questions after that for our panelists to respond to. And time permitting, we will take questions from the audience at the end. So please feel free to share any questions you have to the chat. To the chat. So first we will have Ratne, uh, Ratna, sorry, Ratna, Ratna Sae and Hannah Brixi to begin the events, but let me introduce them first. 
Radna Sai is a senior advisor on gender in, in the International Monitoring Fund. Fund. And in that role, she's respect, responsible for mainstreaming gender in the fund's core activity surveillance programs and capacity development. She has taught in many universities, including Delhi University, Columbia University, New York University, and holds a PhD in economics from NYU. Hannah Buxi is a global director for gender at the World Bank, where she leads a global effort to promote gender equality and women's empowerment. She sets the overall direction for the World Bank Group's gender knowledge and gender, drives bank-wide efforts for results in closing gender gaps, and foster partnerships with public and private sector stakeholders towards innovation at scale. And as I mentioned before, after the introductions, we're going to have to hear from Lauren and Laura, who will be our speakers for the first panel. Lauren Rumble is the Associate Director of Gender Equality at UNICEF. She has been working as a child and women rights advocate with the United Nations and other organizations for the past 15 years. She's passionate about using evidence to influence policy and leverage greater investments for women and girls, including to end poverty and violence. And at last but not least, we have Laura Turkey, which, who is the Deputy Chief of Research and Data with UN Women. For the past 12 years, she has worked at UN Women, leading major research and data initiatives that inform the organization's advocacy objectives and empower civil society and governments to seek and implement change, including most recently uh, uh, the publication titled Beyond COVID-19, a feminist plan for sustainable and social justice. So thank you for, to you all for being here. Um, after we will hear from Lauren and Laura, we will move to panel two. Uh, to get the country and regional uh, implications. So now, uh, right now, if you're ready, I would like um, to pass the mic over to you with your insights. Over to you right now. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you today uh, to discuss the urgent need for high quality, affordable, accessible childcare. Uh, this topic could not be more pertinent today the ongoing COVID pandemic and the fallout of the war in Ukraine are causing distress across the world. Food and fuel prices have skyrocketed and many countries are facing food shortages and debt servicing problems. These developments, as well as longer term trends like the climate change and recurrent conflicts across the globe are testing the resilience of economies and societies. So it's really an opportune time to find innovative ways to reduce the hardships people are facing and to revive economies. At a general level, there is increasing evidence, including work that we have done at the IMF that shows that closing gender gaps raises economic growth reduces income inequality, enhances financial stability, and builds resilience of economies. In other words, gender equality is a win-win for women and the world. But we know that in many countries, despite the mounting evidence, we see that gender gaps persist. So let me focus on labor force participation rates we find that gender gaps are large. The global average is about 53% for women, much lower than that of 80% for men. Studies have shown that closing these gaps can raise economic growth both directly and indirectly via raising productivity. Moreover, a growing economy alleviates fiscal constraints and improve debt dynamics, which are much needed today. So the question is, why are these gaps not closing? Let me offer an example from my own home country, India. In 2019, the share of women in the labor force stood at 22%, way below the global average. <clears throat> On the other hand, the rates for Indian men were similar to the global average at 
We know that during the COVID crisis, the participation rates of women declined even further. Delving into the causes of these large gaps, a study from the National Statistical Office provides insights into one potential driver, unpaid care work. Surveys show that women spent nearly four hours more each day. That's a lot on these activities. Another study, as reported in the Hindustan Times, finds that 43% of unemployment, unemployed women in India were not able to take on paid work due to household demands, which included childcare. Interestingly, this number is less than 2% for men. Remarkably too, more than 65% of Indian women with at least a postgraduate degree said that household duties restricted their ability to pursue paid work. And while these statistics paint a sobering picture for India, women around the world face various kinds of legal, cultural, and economic barriers that lead to low female labor force participation rates. But there is a silver lining. Policies can and do make a difference. In the case of India itself, IMF research also found that states that are introducing gender budgeting have made much more progress on gender equality, particularly in primary school enrollment than those without. A cross-country study showed that cutting the cost of childcare by half could increase the number of young mothers in the labor market by 10%. In Sweden, greater parity between maternity and paternity leave has helped mothers return to work more rapidly and has even shifted underlying gender norms about parenting. In Norway, the expansion of universal childcare for toddlers increased the likelihood of mothers' reemployment by 32 percentage points. That is a staggering number. These studies point to the power of designing gender responsive policies that increase female labor force participation rates and hence economic growth. Recognizing that the macroeconomic significance of gender equality. We at the IMF plan to launch our very first gender mainstreaming strategy after it's approved by our executive board later this month. I am confident that working with our 119 member countries and our international partners like the World Bank and the UN Women and stakeholders, we will make a difference to benefit women and the larger society. I look forward to insights from a rich discussion and excellent speakers we have with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ratna, for your folks. Next, we'll hear from Anna. Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Erina, and uh, greetings to you all. As I'm Hannah Brixi, Global Director for John Gender at the World Bank Group, and I am pleased to be here for this important and very timely discussion. In my opening, I would like to make six points uh, broadly in response to the questions posed by Erina at the outset on the why and how to further advance investments in childcare. So first, together, we need to better promote understanding of the importance of childcare for children. The lack of access to quality childcare is denying many children and their families a fair chance. And we jointly have a lot of evidence demonstrating this. We estimate that uh, a child living in a low income country is nearly five times less likely to have access to childcare than a child living in a high income country. Second, together we can further strengthen the understanding and promotion of the link between childcare and women's economic empowerment. As Ratna highlighted, we know how labor force participation and access to affordable quality childcare go hand in hand. 
childcare constraints represent a major barrier to women's labor force participation and also to their occupational choices. Globally, women spend three times longer on unpaid care work than men and only about half as much on paid work. Third point, we need to jointly promote better recognition of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and other crises with respect to childcare. Caregiving responsibilities have increased in response or during these crises in many countries and women's employment and economic opportunities have suffered in consequence. For example, recent World Bank studies show that female-led firms were on average more likely to close their businesses, mainly due to school closures and childcare burden. And they also experienced a larger revenue declines than male-led firms during the crisis. Fourth, Together, we need to leverage the potential of the care economy. Expanding quality childcare can yield multi-generational impacts by promoting equity and improving women's employment and productivity, child development and nutrition outcomes, family welfare, business productivity, and overall economic development. And expanding the childcare economy and building the childcare workforce also can create up to 43 million new jobs while facilitating more people, particularly women, to be able to seek or return to employment. Fifth point, we need to build on evidence on what works and how to expand childcare. World Bank evidence, for example, including the evidence generated by our Gender Innovation Labs, shows that even when childcare is available, the high cost of user fees or poor quality or distance or operating hours or social norms or other constraints can prevent uptake. So we need to design childcare interventions based on solid analysis of the local context and local constraints. Our analysis suggests multiple possible entry points for childcare interventions. For example, using skills training program to build quality childcare workforce. Also, childcare to facilitate women's participation in skills training, employment, and public works program. Also, supporting women entrepreneurs to open their own childcare business via different grants or other sustainable financing model. Also prioritizing childcare in micro, small and medium enterprises and providing subsidies, grants to support women and men in the informal sectors, including cash contributions to maternity and paternity leave provisions. And we have already jointly among us here, we have a lot of examples to give you just a few from the bank side, uh, for example, in Bangladesh, our uh, second programmatic jobs uh, development policy credit includes policy actions to approve and support the implementation of the Child Daycare Act to increase the number of daycare centers, meeting quality requirements and providing significant job opportunities for women. In addition, in a number of countries such as Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Rwanda and Ethiopia, we have been experimenting together with our uh, partners and uh, with governments to, in setting up mobile crash services to support women to participate in public work program. And finally, my sixth point, we have new opportunities now for partnership through the Child Care Initiative, which Erina mentioned. So along with our partners, the World Bank has launched the Global Child Care Invest, uh, Incentive Fund, which takes a whole of the World Bank Group approach to support countries in the design and implementation of better childcare programs to improve policies, to build capacity, to generate data and provide evidence on the impact of childcare on women's empowerment, early childhood development and inclusive economic growth. This fund is set to catalyze at least $180 million in new funding to ensure quality, affordable childcare that would be available in low and middle income countries worldwide. 
It will include a small catalytic grants to help make the case for childcare and design quality operations based on local needs and context. We will award our first 10 country level grants in September uh, uh, this year. And we expect to award at least 30 more grants during the next five years. It will also include global analytic work to increase the quantity and quality of data across countries to build evidence base and to develop tools and guidance. It will include activities to integrate childcare into ongoing capacity building programs. And finally, the fund will match country investments in childcare on dollar for dollar basis up to $10 million per country, which would be used alongside funding from the World Bank, IDA and IBRD arms, and also funding from other development partners, private sector resources, and countries' own commitments, so that each grant helps to catalyze wider investment and returns. And I'm delighted that we have these new opportunities for partnerships, and we have the expanded evidence base among ourselves and expanded experience that we can really jointly leverage. So I look forward to the discussion and I look forward to further collaboration. Thank you and back to you, Irina. Thank you so much, Anna. It's really great to see both the IMF and the World Bank working together, but also sharing similar perspectives and visions and promoting childcare as a driver of positive outcomes for both children and women. Now, I would like to shift to Laura and Lauren with a simple question. The evidence on childcare, and as we've heard from uh, Ratna and Hannah already, points to a very, very simple message. We know that childcare is good for children, childcare is good for women, it is good for families, but it's also good for economies. So from the perspective of your organization's work and mission, can you build on that and help us understand why? And basically make the case as to why governments should prioritize strengthening childcare systems over other type of investments. Laura, over to you. Sorry, am I going first? I thought I thought we were going to Lauren, but yeah, I'm very happy to go first. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Irina, for that introduction and for the opportunity to uh, contribute to this uh, discussion. It's really, I think, exciting to see so much energy and momentum around this issue, um, which uh, UN Women's Research and Data Team, of which I'm part, um, has been working on for a number of years. In fact, in 2015, we published a policy brief um, which identified this triple dividend of investments in childcare services for women, for children and for broader economies. So it's great to see um, that uh, gaining traction. Um, and it's also so important to see major investments being made in additional uh, research and, and policy um, on this issue, notably through the, the World Bank's new fund, um, which will enable uh, us to take that framing uh, to concretely identify uh, what the policy options are for scaling up childcare ser services, especially in, in low resource settings. Um, so in the time that I have available, I've been asked to look at the implications of these investments um, uh, for women as both parents and as workers. And so I wanted to make um, three points. So I think we've already heard um, uh, quite a lot of interesting um, data from uh, both Hannah and Ratna on the, uh, the, the fact that the lack of quality affordable childcare has a huge impact on women's employment. I also wanted to extend that uh, to uh, look at the impact it has on women's um, experience of extreme poverty. So looking at labor force participation first, um, just to kind of add additional evidence to what we've already heard, um, we've been working over a number of years with the ILO to analyze labor force statistics by marital status and presence of children in the household. And what this shows us is that women who live in couple households with young children are much less likely to be in the labor force than men um, in the same households or compared to single women without children. So we, we looked at um, what's called prime working age adults, age 25 to 54, which is also the time when people are most likely to be or to become parents. And um, looking at that age range, 95% of men are in the labor force compared to 62% of women. But this falls to 55% of women in couple households with children under the age of six. But for men in the same households, their labor force participation actually increases to 97%. And there are regional variations, but this pattern does hold for almost all regions. So being a mother reduces women's labor force participation significantly, while being a father actually increases it. 
the other point that I wanted to make um, in this regard is about how the lack of adequate childcare presents a barrier to women accessing, accessing better paid formal jobs. So this is a major concern when 750, uh, 740 million women worldwide are in the informal economy. In some countries in the global south, upwards of 90% of all employment is in the informal economy. And where there isn't access to um, uh, good quality, uh, um, affordable childcare, women will often take informal jobs in, in ways that they can combine it with, with doing childcare as well, rather than, um, if you like, upgrading or looking for, for, for better quality jobs. Um, I think we've already heard that the increase in unpaid care work during the pandemic has increased women's disadvantage. Um, and for women with small children, the labor force participation during the pandemic has declined from 55% to 53%. Um, you know, when women are uh, already disadvantaged in labour markets, we, we cannot afford uh, to see this, this backward uh, movement. Um, not surprisingly, um, when women uh, have less access to the labour market, there's also an impact on extreme poverty. So our work with the World Bank over several years has shown that uh, gender gaps in extreme poverty, as measured by women's presence in poor households, is especially wide during their peak reproductive years from 25 to 34. And among this age group, 24% more women are living in extreme poverty than men of the same age. So in sum, on this first point, investments in childcare services are not only good for children, as we will hear from Lauren, as we've already heard from Hannah, but they can support mother's employment face barriers to their labour force participation. I want to make um, the other really important contribution of investments in childcare services is through employment uh, creation in the care sector. Um, although care jobs are of course not only for women, we know that from experience they will be taken up by women in disproportionate numbers. In 2018, UN Women commissioned um, some leading feminist economists to devise a methodology to cost universal childcare services and this analysis has now been applied in at least 15 countries. Depending on the various scenarios applied, universal childcare services could increase women's employment rate by We seem to have lost Laura. Laura, can you hear us? Yes, I think we have lost Laura. So maybe Lauren, you want to come in now? Lauren, you're on mute. Between. Oh, there I am. There, uh, Laura, you're back. Can you hear us? Okay. Oh, maybe she's just on picture. Um, Laura, feel free to jump in anytime if you get uh, the internet back and we, we can hear your, your closing. Um, actually, what we have to say is um, so in common um, with a lot of overlaps, which shows the power of coming together on common messages. And, you know, from the side of UNICEF, I'm just so delighted to be here with so many diverse partners, so many wonderful participants. I've been monitoring the chat and just seeing where everybody's coming from, academia, civil society, the UN, some governments, um, super exciting. At the UNICEF side, um, this is a joint agenda. Um, we feel it is so compelling and so important that we've brought to bear our social protection teams, our early childhood and development teams, our gender teams, and more. Um, this is something that we really believe in leads to many benefits. And so, Irina, you were asking me to talk about the benefits of childcare. And, you know, it's really easy to do because, in my view, they're so obvious. So many of us online today can even relate at a deeply personal level. I wonder if for those listening, you might want to put into the chat right now, how many of you have benefited from childcare in one way or another? And do you remember how it felt? Um, if you could use one word to describe that feeling of when your first day of benefiting from childcare. I know as a really busy, overwhelmed working mother, when my first son managed to go to daycare, um, and we both adjusted to it. There were some mixed feelings in the beginning, but then he used to run out of my arms to go and meet his friends and the childcare workers. And the sense of joy and freedom that gave us both still lasts me. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is the triple dividend of investing in childcare, because as my previous speakers have talked about so powerfully and with such good evidence, thank you, Hannah, um, investing in childcare is good for children, for families and for economies. Dwelling now on the benefits for children, we know that good nutrition and health and nurturing care in the early years stimulates unparalleled, unprecedented brain development, unique opportunity in life that never happens again, that in turn reaps multiple intergenerational dividends for society. And successful societies invest in their children and protect their rights. We have know this from research for decades from countries that have done well on health and economic measures. Similarly, childcare builds a foundation upon which every aspect of child's development, children's development relies. So we need accessible, affordable and quality public childcare services, both as a basic right and an essential component of public service delivery. So why is it that so many politicians still do not prioritize such investments, nor see them as the foundation for broader societal improvements? Is it because those investments are too long term and don't match with political terms? Is it because it requires too much multi-sectoral investments? Is it because it's too um, new in terms of the evidence? This terrible state of affairs has become very clear to us as other speakers have highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, where we all experienced a very visible and gendered crisis of care, where parents and caregivers, especially women, as Laura highlighted, struggle to balance childcare and employment. Women were spending three times longer on care and housework than men, leading to many leaving the workforce. We don't have the data on girls as strongly, but we know too that this resulted in child marriage and projected figures of child marriage are expected to grow um, more and more, setting us far off course from the SDG targets. And that's one of the reasons the UN Secretary General has raised the alarm on gender, um, saying that we've really come back to generations when it comes to gender equality gains. Childcare is thus essential to the survival of the family and is critical to promoting gender equality, including women's equal participation in the economy. So with all this evidence and this strong rationale, what do we need to do now? We need to take all of us, all the participants online from all our diverse backgrounds with the very best in data, advocacy, activism, and program modeling to really exert pressure on the public and private sectors to better invest in childcare. I wanna focus on just three areas of investment. One, we need to push for access to quality, affordable childcare as a key pillar of any economic recovery plan in this COVID-19 context. Childcare should be part of a broader package of social protection and childcare, including access to child subsidies, parental leave, breastfeeding breaks and facilities, and support for safe, inclusive, and discriminatory free workspaces. These investments must continue into adolescence. Yes, the early years are important, but that support needs to continue for education subsidies and protection services. Second, we need to engage with champion businesses and governments to role model what affordable childcare looks like and how to take it to scale. UNICEF, for example, somebody put in the chat a question around migration. We're working with the government of Rwanda and a local civil society partner, ADEPE, to roll out childcare services on the border between Rwanda and the DRC. Mothers who were crossing the borders every day to work for 10 to 12 hours in the markets were leaving their children behind. But now with this support, women caregivers who are trading in these markets can leave their children in safe and stimulating childcare spaces, but that also provides safe breastfeeding options for mothers to be able to access during their workday. In Argentina, originally we were looking at a problem of only 19% of children under three years benefiting from any kind of childcare and only 50% of parents having access to parental leave. We've been working with government and other partners to help revise the existing family leave legislation and access to parental care for all caregivers. Those advocacy actions have resulted in a draft bill being presented to Congress, which guarantees parents the right to childcare and co-parenting. This has had really ripple effects in the private sector too, where we're seeing um, as of last year, more than 170 companies improving their capacity to implement family-friendly policies, including parental leave. These are transformative, long-lasting actions for children, for families, and those economies. Third, we need to formalize and expand childcare services by promoting the training and professionalization of the childcare workforce. We need proper care infrastructure, improving the working conditions of childcare workers, many of whom are women, we've seen them, we know them. We know that they're poorly paid, if at all, and struggling to care for their own children. So we need to support them in order to support adherence to the highest quality of care in those facilities. 
they should also be linked to those facilities with other services like social welfare, health, nutrition, so that the children can benefit from multi-sectoral services and ultimately the true nature of nurturing care. I believe and we believe that all of these things are possible. Those investments are affordable, not just as a fundamental right, but as something that makes true economic sense. And we can make that sense even in humanitarian contexts. Right now in the Ukraine and in the surrounding countries, UNICEF is working with an array of partners, especially to support refugees through something called the Blue Dot Hubs. And these hubs provide refugees and other vulnerable families with critical information and practical support to help them in their onward journeys. For children, those blue dot hubs provide a safe, welcoming space to rest, to play, and be a child. But it also is a place where parents and caregivers can access counseling, and parenting, and psychosocial support who may be facing considerable trauma and stress. So if we can do it in these deeply difficult and humanitarian contexts, we can certainly do it in others and at scale. We've proven it's possible together with governments and the private sector. Now we just need to make it a reality for everybody. Thank you so much, and Irina, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Florian. Um, I believe Laura is back online. Laura, I'm going to give you the floor for a quick, uh, your last point, your concluding point. Over to you. Yep, thanks for that, Irina. Sorry, my internet connection went down, and in fact, I'm getting another message that it's unstable. Um, I think the main point that I wanted to make uh, really was about the quality of childcare work, uh, the quality of work for childcare workers. So I think Lauren has has mentioned this. There's very long-standing research on care workers that finds that, in spite of the the growing recognition of the vital contribution. I'm afraid we have lost Laura again. All right, so um, let's move on to the second part of the of this uh, discussion today, panel two. And for that, let me introduce uh, Megan, uh, but thank you, Laura and Lauren, uh, for your very important insights. Um, so now we, we will move to um, country and regional implications. Um, and Should they make? I would like to introduce Megan O'Donnell, who is a policy fellow and assistant director for gender at the Center for Global Development. We moderate the last panel. So, Megan, over to you. Thanks so much, Irina, and thank you so much to the previous speakers. It's really exciting to hear about uh, the rigorous research and the exciting programs that UNICEF and UN Women have led in this space. Uh, and perhaps even more exciting to see such powerful institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund taking uh, increasing leadership to promote quality, accessible, and affordable childcare as core to their priorities around gender equality, early childhood development, and economic development. We're going to shift now from hearing from uh, those with a global perspective to those with a uh, national one, taking a deeper dive into uh, particular country case studies, both from a policymaking perspective and a civil society and advocacy one. Uh, so I would ask uh, panelists for this second panel to turn on their videos if they're able and join me on screen. I am very, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Rachel Davey, Nadine Umatoni, and Susan Otieno. And Rachel, huge thanks especially to you for joining us so late your time, uh, later than 1, 1 a.m. now in Fiji. So we are especially grateful to have you join us. Um, I'm going to introduce each of you and then pose a question to each of you and hopefully we will have time at the end to come back all together with each panelist for a round of questions with our audience. So first, uh, Dr. Rachel Davey uh, is the head of Family Health and Medical Services, as well as the ECD focal point for the government of Fiji. And previously she directed efforts to provide safe drinking water uh, in rural areas of the country. Next, Nadine Umatoni is the Director General of the National Child Development Agency in Ru Rwanda, uh, where she coordinates activities that support early childhood development uh, and the promotion and protection of children's rights. Before joining NCD, Nadine was also the Vice Mayor of the city of Kigali, uh, where she was in charge of socioeconomic affairs. 
And last but not least, a welcome to Susan Otieno, who is the Executive Director of Action Aid Kenya, uh, where she has worked since 2005 and held a wide variety of roles, including executing campaigns on unpaid care work and women's economic empowerment. So welcome to all of you again. Thank you so much for joining today's discussion. Rachel and Nadine, I'd like to start with a question for both of you as government representatives. Uh, drawing on your experiences, what would you encourage your counterparts, other government decision makers, uh, to consider in striving to increase and improve investment in quality childcare? And what action steps have you taken uh, in your government context to expand that access to childcare services? So Rachel, why don't we start with you and then over to Nadine next. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Megan. Thank you uh, to the previous panelists. I'm hoping you can hear me proper. All okay. Sweet. So uh, thanks for the questions. And honestly, thank you for the opportunity to speak and share the uh, country experience here. And, uh, you know, while I was just listening to um, the previous panelists, this, from a country perspective, there's three words that really strike out to me. And uh, I'll just speak on these three words and build up on them. And um, for the first one is leadership. And, uh, and in this context, you know, government uh, leadership is so essential. And uh, having said that, if I can speak from the regional perspective as well, with this leadership coming into play, the Pacific as a whole, we've, we've actually come to a place of, uh, we're developing things. And one of the important things was the uh, Pacific call for action, which, uh, which the Pacific did in 2017. And uh, it's basically co-chaired by Fiji and Samoa. And, uh, and I must say this, this webinar is such an untimely manner. We just launched our Pacific website this week and there's a Pacific Islands Forum meeting going on in, in Fiji right now. And uh, great uh, leadership brought in from, and I must, uh, you know, from our prime ministers, ministers and across the board of uh, the various ministers. So I think uh, in terms of leadership, that is so essential that we've got in, um, in, in the Pacific that uh, there's a commitment from them. And uh, you know the other thing, other let, uh, the other word I wanted to share was partnership. Now, when we talk about partnership, it's so essential, and this has happened in Fiji, happening and in the Pacific as well, where as government partners, as government leaders, not just necessarily Ministry of Health or Education or uh, Ministry of Children, we actually partner significantly with our civil society, NGO organizations, and we're pretty strong with the faith-based organizations in the Pacific as well. So these collaborations are so essential in terms of, um, in terms of uh, taking forward the ECD work in the country, uh, in the Pacific in itself. And the last word in this context I wanted to share about was ownership, owning the response. Because without owning it as a government partner and as 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 a leaders, as various leaders in this space, you know, we we lose the traction, we lose the momentum in going in taking this forward. And the Fijian Prime Minister has just become the advocate for things. And and you know, with with all these concepts in place. There's a few things that I can share in terms of, of what Fiji's done is um, we've we've started things from very high level before we even step down to do an action plan or a policy uh, documentation for the country. We've actually stepped out to submit a cabinet paper to parliament to say, OK, this is the direction we want to take and this is what we'd like to step into and getting that endorsement. And that cabinet paper is not just con uh, done by a particular ministry, but it's done in a collaborative manner. It's more of like combined ministries, different various ministries working on one cabinet paper, submitting it to, uh, it, it, to cabinet. And uh, apart from that, you know, that continual uh, collaboration that's been happening and, and the uh, country in the Pacific's, um, well, Fiji per se, we've um, just recently convened our uh, national council so that we've got that overarching body um, in the country that's uh, constantly working on that collaboration, bringing in the partners together. And glad to say that in the council itself, we've got um, members uh, of civil society, um, you know, uh, um, and they've joined us from the very beginning at the um, inaugural meeting and going forward. So these are exciting times for the country. And um, I believe with, you know, with these few words in terms of uh, leadership, partnership and ownership, 
there can be a significant difference that um, the Pacific Island countries uh, will be making in the days to come, uh, years to come as well. And uh, and it's I must say it's really great to hear the earlier panelists and just building up on what's happening at the global level and how we're trickling down to the uh, national level as well. So I think uh, I, be I believe uh, just to answer those questions that you've asked, Megan, um, these are the few things I just like to highlight that's been very prominent for us and um, uh, like you know it's just given us those gear steps ahead to just step step on. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel, and exciting to hear the developments in real time, what's happening in your country and in your region. If you are able to share the newly launched website, I'm sure that's something that would be of great interest to the folks tuning in today. Um, Nadine, now over to you with the same question. Can you speak to your experiences in government in Rwanda and what lessons you would share for your counterparts? Yeah, thank you very much, Megan. Um, thank you, Rachel and uh, Susan and everyone on the on the on the call. Uh, really, thank you, thank you for for it's, it's a pleasure uh, to join um, uh, this session and to share Rwanda's experience in investing in ECD and uh, implementing the country's vision uh, as far as the early childhood development uh, is concerned. Uh, the long-term um, vision of the government of Rwanda is to, to transform the economy from agrarian uh, to a knowledge-based economy with its population as a force um, behind this transformation. But uh, we, we still face a challenge in Rwanda. Uh, for, as per now, we have like 3% of our children uh, below five are stunted. And this is coming from 38, five years ago and from 44% uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, uh, and, and stunting, as we know, hinder uh, the future productivity and the productivity of, the, of our nation. Uh, does our government uh, recognize the investing, uh, that investing in early years is one of the smartest investment? Our country should make uh, to break the cycle of poverty, address inequality, and boost productivity uh, later in life. Our childhood development in Rwanda is recognized as one of the uh, strongest pillars of uh, the Rwanda human capital uh, development and uh, uh, the sustainable development. And it is well highlighted in our seven year uh, uh, national strategy for transformation and the vision 2050. I see I, it echoes to what Lashe was saying on the ownership of the government and the, uh, the planning level. Um, considering the value of ECD in 2016, uh, a comprehensive uh, ECD policy was developed here in Rwanda. And uh, in Rwanda, again, the early childhood development uh, refers to a comprehensive approach to policies and programs for children aged from zero to six years. The our ECD policy is implemented again under six periods, and uh, those are the nutrition, uh, nutritional for, uh, for, for infant and children, below five especially, health services uh, for both the mothers and the children again, especially in the first uh, thousand days of life, access to wash uh, services, early learning and stimulation, parents and caregivers education are referring to uh, positive parenting and child protection. And of course, the child disability issues are all mainstreamed in the six pillars. And uh, since again 2017, in order to ensure optimal access to ECD services and solve the persisting nutrition problems among children, we are taking a multi sectoral uh, approach where the health sector uh, provides most of the health and nutrition services. We have our Minister of Finance that is spearheading uh, the, the exercise we started this year, not called the nutrition budget tagging, where all the concerned institutions uh, plan and budget for uh, intervention related to nutrition. And in this case, the government of Rwanda uh, has established a central level coordination mechanisms um, coordinated at the level of our institution, the National Child Development Agency. And in this regard, to provide uh, a good start to our children, Rwanda had planned to increase the access to, uh, to ECD services from 13% in 2017 to 45% in 2024 by constructing model ECDs centers countrywide and ensuring that at least three home-based ECD are available in each village of Rwanda. To reach this target, it was very, very important to bring on board all partners and stakeholders. Today, we count above 31,000 ECD settings uh, that exist in four types, four types of ECDs. And, um, and you have been able 
now in 2022 to reach at least 50% of children uh, aged from zero to six years. Today we have one, 158 model ECDs, this is one type, and three and 3,343 center and school-based ECDs. These ones are managed uh, by the district level with a strong support and supervision of our Ministry of Education, uh, recalling to them its sectoral approach. And we have 2,080 community-based ECD. These ones are mostly run by the community with the support of local NGOs and faith-based organizations. And now we have 25,000, more than 25,000 um, home-based ECD. These ones are uh, in their homes. Volunteer families open their home to receive the children. And this, that's where we count also the mobile crash uh, uh, Hannah uh, referred to at the beginning of this um, uh, uh, session. Um, we have also um, uh, been able to mobilize the private sector, the private sector to and uh, some of the public uh, uh, sector institution. Uh, with the support, again, Lorraine uh, referred to the support of UNICEF and the local NGOs, we have been able to have so far 45 uh, work-based ECDs, including the one she referred to in the, in the cross-border market. Uh, but we have others in the tea plantation that those ones are opened by the, 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 those, those, uh, uh, the companies, the, 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 the tea plantation, the owners of the tea plantation, rice plantation mining, they open uh, ECD work-based ECD to support the mothers who are working with them in those uh, specific um, uh, companies. And this, as it has been highlighted, is very much beneficial to the women who, who are working, but also beneficial to the private sector itself. It is likely to contribute to, the, uh, to their staff worker um, motivation. So to conclude, it is also worth to, to, to note that ECD centers are used as platform to reach caregivers with nutrition, education, and provision of community-based health and nutrition services, including the growth monitoring promotion. And uh, these community health workers also conduct what we call home visitation ECD services, especially for the uh, children from zero to two years. Uh, and um, with this, I, I conclude and I will provide other clarification later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nadine. Really fascinating to hear about this community-centered approach, these ECD centers across Rwanda. Um, and though you know, you know, progress still left to make, how quickly the stunting rates have dropped uh, among children, I think is, is proof that if a government prioritizes these human development issues, you know, we can see quick progress. So thank you. Um, Susan, now I'm going to turn to you. Encouragingly, both Rachel and Nadine have highlighted how critical partnerships with civil society uh, really are in order to, to ensure success in their work. Um, so as a representative of ActionAid Kenya, would love to hear from your experiences. What have you found to be successful in your advocacy around child care as an issue? Um, and what recommendations or guidance would you give to your civil society counterparts on, on what has worked and what has maybe not worked so much? Susan, you're muted. Thank you, Megan. Can you hear me? Perfect. OK. Yeah. Um, so what we've found to be effective in adv advancing uh, uh, policy on the child care issue um, and also just ensuring that the messaging is resonating with policymaker is the importance of using data and the power of evidence in sharing the inequalities in the unpaid care work and also how childcare and other forms of care were posing a barrier for women to participate in um, leadership. Uh, the Kenyan constitution provides for no less, um, no, sorry, more than two third gender rule uh, as part of the affirmative action. So ensuring that you have a minimum of uh, a third of uh, either gender in, um, in, in uh, every leadership uh, structure. And so as we kept working with women, as it is our, our mode and our approach to build women leadership, we realized that women would not show up. And uh, the main reason that both men and women would give was that they do not have enough time to show up to participate in processes, community processes or leadership, um, or even to engage in public participation to be able to contribute on decisions that affected them. And so we decided to conduct the, uh, the time diaries in uh, part of the rural areas in Kenya. 
And what was emerging was that uh, the care work took a lot of their time, care for sick people, care for children in particular, providing for their households, you know, and, and hence it was very difficult for them to set aside time. And this is where this conversation began almost um, seven to 10 years ago for us as Action Aid. Um, we also realized that um, while you, we get to engage with policymakers, what was very important was to allow women from the front line to speak and share their stories to get the matter home. Um, I can stand and talk about childcare, but someone will tell me, you can afford, why are you bringing the government in? But when these women spoke about first their conditions, they are living in marginalization, um, the access to care becomes a challenge, yet they want to provide for their families. Um, it, it became very clear for, for the government and other actors to see the sense of uh, Kenya as a country to start looking into the care work, uh, care policy. Um, then the more we gave the data and the evidence, we also saw that the government uh, got uh, interested. Now, turning to the advocates, the, some of the most important things that um, I would also share in terms of what worked uh, for us and, and what is working, because right now, as I speak, we are part of a task force, a government uh, set up task force to be able to come up with a care policy in, in the country. Um, one of the things that we noted was that there are several ministries that um, are key to successful care related policies. And hence, there is need for all advocates to work collaboratively. Otherwise, as CSOs, if we all went uh, to all these ministries and going there at different times, then we'd find that uh, there's burnout, there's congestion, yet we are addressing one critical issue, which is childcare and more so the care policy. And so working under a task force collaboratively and being able to pull the respective government ministries in one space and thus talking about it and how it's going to affect the delivery of their work, but also improving people's lives became is one of the lessons that we learned. Um, the other aspect is that all advocates therefore needed to push for a child-centered um, care policy as well and incorporate the lens of taking into account the women's uh, economic justice and rights as well. Because we are saying free time for the women and let them participate in processes that empower them, in processes that guarantee their rights, in processes that guarantee economic uh, um, justice for them in their spheres. And so there are, um, I would call it intersectionalities in, in, um, in, in uh, approaches and uh, therefore issues that we look at around women. When you're talking of women economic justice, you cannot fail to talk about childcare and hence a care policy that takes care of even those who are not uh, 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 marginalized and less privileged. Um, there's also the aspect of uh, the government prioritization of childcare is reflected in its budgetary allocation. And therefore, as you push for care work, it's important to see that uh, has the government started from the domestic financing level? Because that then shows you how critical they value it and where they're saying that whether we receive support externally or not, this has to work. So it starts with that kind of commitment um, to demonstrate that um, you, you're succeeding as advocate, but also the government is putting it, um, giving it the, the importance that it deserves. Yeah, so I'll probably choose to stop there and I can be, I'm available for any other question. That's great, thank you so much, Susan. I fully agree with your starting point, which is to make sure that that rigorous data and evidence uh, is generated and then translated into informing policy because it's the only way we know that the policies will ultimately benefit, right? The people that we're seeking to reach and love the example you shared of the time use diaries to make the case to policymakers that this is an issue really in need of being addressed. Happy to hear that the Kenyan government has been receptive, right? And there now is this, this influencing window opportunity that you're engaged in. With all of you now back on the screen, um, I would ask Laura and Lauren if their connectivity allows to also join us. 
um, and Hannah Brixey, if she's still online, so that we can now shift gears into a question and answer session. Um, we've had a lot of energy and enthusiasm from the audience already, so I'm going to do my best to get through as many of these questions uh, as possible. And Laura, thanks so much for being flexible in typing your answers. Um, would encourage everyone to look into the chat if you haven't seen it already uh, to see Laura's concluding remarks, since unfortunately connectivity limited her ability to close out fully. Um, first, uh, we have a set of practical questions on Rachel, to your earlier point about leadership and ownership within government, practically, where does this agenda sit? Who is leading it? So are within your governments, there a dedicated early childhood development sort of section or ministry? Does that sit under a ministry of health or education or women or children? Um, and maybe for this one, I'll turn to Rachel and Nadine first to speak to their context, but then broaden out Susan, Lauren, and Laura to speak to other contacts that you're aware of. Uh, so Rachel, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Megan. Yes, an important question as well. Uh, so basically the in Fiji, it sits under Ministry of Health. I lead that uh, coordination for the government right now uh, with the support of, I must say it's co-chaired. Right now, what we've done is uh, while Ministry of Health uh, chairs it, it's co-chaired by uh, our Ministry of Children as well, just in case if uh, one of the Permanent sector is not available, the other one is, so there's high level leadership leading their process. So um, that's uh, that, that's an important one for us, yeah. I believe I've answered your question there. Yeah, Nadine, is that similar in Rwanda or does it, does it sit differently? Well, uh, in Rwanda, when we talk about uh, the coordination, of, well, our, our, our agency is, uh, is affiliated to the Minister of Gender and Family Promotion. But uh, um, th th that specific ministry is part of what we call social cluster ministry, where we, we are chaired by the Ministry of Education, uh, the Ministry of uh, Health, and we have uh, sports, uh, culture, and, and other ministries. And uh, uh, th 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 that's where we, uh, when we have like policies and, uh, and any document to discuss, that's where it is approved. But for now, the, the 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 direct ministry we have for now is the Ministry of Gender. But as I said, our uh, our way of working, especially when it, it, it concerns the ECD summit sectoral approach. So we 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 make sure that we have a close relationship with the Minister of Health, especially when we talk about nutrition and 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 and, and the health of the of the mothers and the, the infants. Uh, but again, uh, the coordination is done by that, that level of the ministry and then uh, Minister of Gender, but in close collaboration of the Minister. Of health, education, and Ministry of Local Government and Social Protection. Uh, those are the key ministries. And then again, at the end of the day, we report to the Prime Minister's office. Yeah, I don't know if I respond to the question. So yeah. That's perfect. And interesting to see both the similarities, but also the differences in how this is being uh, approached in different countries. Susan, Lauren, and Laura, what on your radar have you seen across other country contexts? And I would also ask for candor in, in everyone's assessment of the pros and cons of such a multi-sector approach, right? Obviously, uh, Lauren, as you underscored, this is a triple dividend. This cuts across so many benefits for so many populations, but can that sometimes lead to balls being dropped because there is no one sort of central leader on this particular issue? Um, Susan, why don't we start with you and then over to Lauren. Yeah, so uh, in Kenya, the State Department for Gender uh, coordinates um, and uh, of course it brings in the, its respective Ministry of Gender, it also brings in Ministry of Education, Health is also part of it. Um, and uh, what we have seen um, to be one of the challenges of course is getting the time to draw everyone on board, um, having everybody to, to be on the same page. So I've seen the, the task force that um, had been um, had, was formed, uh, brought in the aspect of capacity building, the aspect of um, uh, exposure, um, trying to let all the stakeholders get to interact with the women themselves at the front line, uh, but also where we get to share um, the stories. Uh, the other challenge that was there was the empirical data as it is. People will always say, okay, fine, your stories are qualitative. Where is the data? But this time we've seen the 
the ministry coming out and saying we have to collect the right data because to be very honest in Kenya and like many African countries, statistics on gender have been wanting. Not available, um, whoever leads in the collection uh, is probably not using a feminist approach whereby you can bring the issues from the perspective of women who are mainly affected. And so we have seen this being done, the Kenya Bureau of Statistics also coming in to champion and lead in the process. And uh, we believe that the data issue would therefore be resolved because it has brought out the evidence that ideally corroborates with what we have bringing, we've been bringing out as case studies and conversations. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And Lauren, over to you. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you for inviting me to be frank. That's my favorite kind of honest to be. Um, you know, the evidence is very clear, as everybody has talked about, and even beyond this panel, that multi-sectoral interventions are the ones that have the greatest impact on children's lives and outcomes. And yet, those same studies also say, do more. It's hard. It's complicated. Because who is it that's managing the money? Often, those who are the coordinators are the least budgeted and the least powerful. So what I love about these country examples that we've heard about today is the high level um, accountability in some countries. Um, when I was working in Indonesia, early childhood and development was really a priority, including childcare, of the president. And so he made it a very clear um, ask of the different sectoral ministries to come together, even though there was one leading one, in this case, education but everybody had a role to play. Um, and that's the, the common thread between all the examples is how everybody is trying to bring the different roles and responsibilities together for a collective powerful outcome. But it means that we do have to start asking hard questions and it can differ from country to country. Who does have the convening power? Is it a Ministry of Education? Is it a Ministry of Health? Um, is it sometimes a Ministry of Gender, although seldom? Um, and that convening power is where the coordination works the best, especially when there's um, outreach. So who has the most um, outreach to vulnerable rural communities where we heard from Hannah, um, childcare is most absent and most needed, arguably. Um, so the competing power, the reach, these are ingredients um, for success, but then also the willingness to collaborate. Um, and that depends on individuals and relationships. And I heard that passion from Rachel. She is willing to really take on that hard work of coordinating, which comes at cost with no cost <laughs> um, because she believes in it she's passionate about it and she's the kind of person who can coordinate so we actually need to really call on individuals to um, to act with that fire and commitment to multi-sectoral work if we're really going to make this happen um, with ultimate of course accountability as high up as we can go and then our role as the UN, um, as civil society actors, is to do whatever we can to create those spaces, nurture those spaces, resource those spaces, so that coordination becomes less of a headache and more um, seamless between sectors. Great to hear that last point. And I hope that this conversation is just the start to longer term relationships where we are identifying ways that some of us sitting at think tanks, at UN agencies and civil society organizations can be supporting that coordination and providing any, any needed resources. Um, Lauren, also really appreciate your example about presidents themselves taking on this issue and how powerful uh, and how accelerated would we start to see this agenda if, if more and more presidents started to, to champion childcare um, as a core uh, part of essential infrastructure, or human capital, or economic development, as you all have noted. Just before we shift gears, I would make a plea on this point, um, sort of along the lines of what uh, gets measured matters because sitting at a research institution, I think one of the ways we promote accountability for cross sectoral approaches to these issues is to make sure that even if it is uh, the Department of Education leading, the Ministry of Gender is coming in to make sure that caregivers outcomes like women's labor force participation or productivity or mental health are measured, are paid attention to in the design, the implementation, the evaluation of those programs. And that the same is true when the onus and the leadership sits elsewhere. Um, but now moving on, thank you all for your reflections on that particular point. We actually have a cluster of questions from the audience around home-based care, mobile care, making it possible for parents and other caregivers just to have more choice 
in uh, particular stages of child development, whether they want to be able to stay home with their own children before maybe eventually employing daycare or child care centers for out of home support. Um, so would love your take and assessment on what works and what else is needed uh, with regard to promoting that agency and choice by, by parents and other caregivers. Nadine, you mentioned the, the mobile and home-based models. Maybe we start with you and then work our way around. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Megan. And thank you for, for, for the question that I've been asked on the home-based ECD. Um, to give a bit a little bit of background is that uh, 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 and in Rwanda, we had that target of reaching older children, ensuring that older children, the age of zero to six, have access uh, to ECD services. But the means could not allow us to build as ECD as we want, as ECD centers as we wanted. And then uh, the, this innovation came up. It was it has uh, has already been uh, piloted by one of the um, the foundation of the First Lady, the Mbuta Foundation. And they had already uh, 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 piloted the home based ECD in different parts. And then it has taken up, been taken up by by by, by the government. It means by by us. And how it happens? We in a village, um, uh, the, the 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 people who live in the same village, they they look around and they choose one home. But we, of course, we have minimum standards. We share with them that it should be a clean, uh, well, a, a, a house um, households with a, a, like a big playground, like uh, a decent toilet and other uh, criteria. And then they choose that place and all the children who are like between three and six years old can come and join and receive the services now who are the caregivers the caregivers are the parents the parents who are trained we make sure that uh with the support of uh we had support of unicef we had the support of the world bank and uh the support of different partners and ngos who come in as we have like a curriculum or where we 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 we, we, we train them on on, on different uh, services how to give them basic trainings and 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 then the children receive the care and uh, uh of course it comes with some challenges um that maybe we need to people on the on the on the on the on the call need to hear. Uh, sometimes uh, we we have not been able. The more we open the home based, we have not been able to have the very same pace of training of the caregiver, especially during the COVID lockdown, where we could not put a call people in a uh, well in a big gathering to train them. That was not uh, was was not possible. Again, during the COVID, some of the home closed. They didn't open again. But this is something we are we working on. We have established. Uh, again, the civil society who are working with the district to support in reopening some of the home-based city to support the parents, to support in the trainings, so that uh, all the home-based city are functioning, and we, we also reach our target of uh, our three home-based city per, 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 per village. So it, it is really working. Some it is really working. The, the, it's very important to look at how the standards are met how all the services are being given and making sure that uh, we are training, the training is continuous for the parents. So the children, uh, the parents also contribute in terms of the children, they, they, they get also a nutritious food there and uh, the parents contribute as the, as the means they have. Like I can bring woods, I can, the, the other parents bring porridge, I don't bring beans, I don't bring rice and then prepare a meal for the children in the, in the same home. And, and, and again, the community health workers, they come in and they, and they, and they, and they provide health services to the children, like the, the growth monitoring I talked about earlier, the other health services to the children in the, that specific age. So in a few words, this, but maybe if you want to make share a more of a document on the home base city now on the on the on the mobile crash this was existing with um with uh, the the what we had the uh, the VUP and it's a uh, it's um uh, public works where uh, the most vulnerable people they go and work and being paid and uh, we found out that among those people, there were mothers who had babies who could not come to, to work. And then with the support of the World Bank, they, they, they started to have a mobile crash that was um, mobile according to where the, the work was moving, especially uh, these works comes to, to, to uh, like to build roads. And when the, the more we progress in the building the roads, also the, more, the, the crash move with the with the works if i could say but with this uh we are now moving from this to the home basis as i said because we have introduced what we call an extended uh, public works where we we look at those mothers who have uh the caregiving caregiver, who are caregivers of like elders or babies and then we create simple home-based dcds and then the mothers come to work and they paid 
for taking care of the children in the home base without going to the uh, work. So this is something under the NCDS, I'm sure Anna is aware of that. So yeah, in a few words, that's it, but we can still share more on, on this. Thank you. Megan, if you allow me, I would just Please to, jump like in, to jump in. <laughs> come in to kind of uh, build on, on the, the excellent examples and, and uh, 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 kind of evaluation of the approaches by Nadine. And I would like to make three points. One is that it really matters to consider the local conditions, the local context, including the uh, on the demand side and on the supply side. And I think that that's why it's just so important to engage communities and to engage the private sector, including private sector solutions in, when considering uh, uh, expansion of childcare. The second point I would like to make is that it's really important to consider incentives. To what extent the child provision is to serve as a nudge, a nudge to early childhood development, employment, to what extent we need to consider positive externality of the provision of childcare. And to what extent there are uh, you know, choices where we want to have, or where, one, where, where it is desirable to have more neutrality so that there is a less of bias in the decision-making in, in households. And it is not trivial, uh, you know, the, uh, considering for example, so parental leave and, and other, uh, uh, um, uh, other incentives and other policies that uh, kind of can balance to some extent uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, child care option. And my third point is uh, what we hear recently, especially in the context of the COVID and post COVID crisis is that uh, home-based work, you know, flexibility given to, to women and men by their employers actually is also very powerful tool that kind of uh, uh, is almost at the level of childcare in the impact it can have on women's uh, uh, ability to participate in the workforce or in specific occupations. So, so sometimes it's also good to consider in some contexts, it's also good to consider the, the kind of the, the, the policies that employers provide and the flexibility that employers provide to women and men. Thank you. Thank you. And that last point, I think, is so well noted. I think the COVID context, by necessity, has forced us all to think in these more creative ways about how we balance work and, and other responsibilities in life. Um, as we wrap up this round of, of questions and answers, Susan, then Lauren, then Rachel, I'd ask for just one minute from each of you reflecting on the same question, and then we're going to turn to our closing speaker. So Susan, you go ahead first. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I think what um, I would be looking at for me is um, the kind of alliances that we get to form to be able to push for um, care policies that work. Um, if we do not focus on the grassroots and the grassroots women, then we are not doing any justice to them. Um, if we stop at policy and fail to think of the implementation framework that is affordable, that uh, countries can afford, then we are not doing justice again to the women. If at countries, um, and I'd written it on the wall, so that's why I was relaxed. <laughs> was that uh, what is critical is also to know the government systems that exist. For a country like Kenya, we have the national and country county government. And uh, therefore the integration of these two is important because you find that it's multi-sectoral. How do we ensure that there's integration of what's happening at the national level? And how does it cut across to county governments? Because both governments have the, the role of policy making. And um, just looking at uh, the coalitions is to ensure, as it was said, that we have all the critical ministries, but also focusing on all the critical um, uh, areas. And uh, this, therefore, would uh, call upon uh, processes that um, are cutting across the gender ministry, education, labor, treasury, and planning. And, and um, not leaving behind the other key stakeholders who are very critical. 
not only the non-state actors, but also as we've had the private sector, because these are the employers. These are the people who are charged with that responsibility as well, because they have female employees working within their spaces. Thank you so much, Susan. Across and down, we need that coordination across levels of government, down the chain, across civil society and private sector. Lauren, any final reflections from you? I mean, I think what the previous panelists have really emphasized is that home-based care and even family-based care um, makes nurturing care more accessible. And that is half of the equation. But the other half of the equation is, of course, quality. Otherwise, we won't get those triple dividends. We won't get those outcomes for children, families, and economies. Um, and we really, we all know that as caregivers, as um, practitioners, as policymakers, that quality matters. And so for that quality, you know, um, we've heard people talk about the importance of training, of skills building. We also need monitoring. We need regular check-ins. We need to keep checking on the status of children. How also are those um, childcare workers doing? Have they been properly remunerated, properly trained? Are they also getting care themselves, care for the caregivers, we call it? Um, and we need to constantly be absolutely vigilant about a zero policy, a zero tolerance policy for any kind of violence or harm. Where there's children, there's always vulnerability um, alongside great opportunity. And so that's where the professionalization of childcare work um, becomes a must. It's not a nice to have, but an absolute must. So I'll close there. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. And final word, Rachel. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I believe the other panelists have definitely highlighted a significant amount of you know, content there. And uh, you know, I totally agree. COVID has taught us so much. And uh, I myself have learned from the home-based uh, sharing that's been done today. But you know, one thing I just wanted to share is you know, Fiji addressed COVID in a whole of societal manner whole of government, whole of society, Every, everyone was on board on things. Even to the point I had, uh, you know, uh, uh, preachers, pastors, uh, uh, tell, you know, uh, them having a Zoom session with me on, with their uh, leaders, with their followers, and, uh, you know, talking about vaccines. So, I mean, I think we've learned a lot from COVID and replicating that, uh, you know, in, in ECD is so essential. And, uh, you know, I sat there one day and I was like, could we replicate the same concept across the other programs that we do right now? So that was one of the important learnings for, uh, for us, for me personally. And I think I just want to leave it at that. And uh, I believe that collaboration is so important. Without that, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's yeah. thanks. Thank you, Rachel. I want to thank all of you one last time for your rich and insightful contributions to the conversation. We look forward to staying in touch to reinforce one another's efforts. And now I want to give the floor to someone we all have learned so much from on this agenda, and that's Joan Lombardi, uh, who is a senior fellow at Georgetown and more recently Stanford. She is also the chair of the policy and advocacy group for ECDAN. Joan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. What a fantastic panel and great moderation. <clears throat> I, I think um, over and over again, we heard partnerships, alliances, collaboration. And I just want to give a big shout out to Brett and the whole team at ECDAN because you're really, um, you're modeling that. You know, I come to this as a former government official responsible for childcare, a researcher, an academic, but more than anything, an advocate. And I want to underscore so many points, uh, and I'll be very brief today, but I want to start with what Susan said about the grassroots. If I've learned anything over the last 50 years, it's that we can't move this agenda without a groundswell uh, of support from the bottom up, um, as well as leadership at the top. And uh, those voices of parents and providers are key. We've heard over and over again from Laura, from Lauren, from all of you, the triple dividend, using that lexicon, using that language. And I think Radna started it off with very good facts about the gender gap, 53% of women compared to 80% of men. 
but she also contextualize it to her own, to a, a single country, to India. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to take those facts that we have at the global level and contextualize it at the, at the local level, at, at the country level. Hannah put children as the second point along with gender. And Lauren said, and that time in a child's life will never return. We have to put the emotion into this because for children, where they're spending that day matters. And the lack of access that Hannah pointed out is so important for us. And finally, the, on the why side, the jobs, 43 million jobs could be created. We need to contextualize that to how many jobs that means in every single country where we're working. I would also add education as a key because the lack of childcare is keeping girls out of school as they care for younger siblings, and we know that. Um, on the policy side, I want to make five quick points. Leadership matters. We heard that from everyone, and I'm so grateful to the World Bank, to the IMF, to the ILO, to UN Women for the global leadership you are showing. It is making a difference. And to our partners, the, the examples from Fiji, from Rwanda and Kenya shows what happens when you have leadership in a country um, and that convening power wherever it starts. Second, we have to have a broad agenda. And I think the ILO's uh, reports that show and talk about what we want is paid leave, we want breaks for breastfeeding, we want childcare, but it's in a broad context. Third, we want this to become part of the recovery package, but we also want it to become part of the economic package in a country, uh, the humanitarian plans, the education plan. So it's gotta be integrated in, into all those policies. Fourth, I think we've gotta be very clear that we need public investments. Affordability and compensation for the caregivers are two sides of the same coin. We need public investments. We need public su subsidy. The private sector can be our partners, but we need public investment, both in subsidy and in the infrastructure, including data collection. And finally, I think that we've got to integrate WASH, nutrition, and all of the other uh, important platforms that support child development into childcare. Our nutrition policies should be pivoting now, not just to the household level, but to the childcare level. We had an amazing number of fantastic uh, examples today, particularly around home-based care, which I'm very excited about. ECDAN will be collecting those, uh, working with all these partners. And I really hope um, I'm very energized by this. I hope you are, because we're going to move this agenda forward for children, for families, and for the economy. Thank you, and have a wonderful week. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's webinar, and we look forward to it, continuing the conversation. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Goodbye, thank you very much.